Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. Today we're talking about de-radicalizing in the Middle East and elsewhere. In a world of terror, de-radicalization is critical and possibly it's also impossible. Uh, so for this show, we have Tim Apicella, my co-host. We have Gene Rosenfeld, who is a, an esteemed guest as always. Uh, and we have Jason Olson, United States Navy Lieutenant Commander foreign area officer. You're going to hear more about what he does. Anyway, welcome to the show, all of you guys. Thank you. So, Gene, let me go to you first and ask you, what is radicalization? Um, and is it accidental? How does it happen? It is not accidental at all. Uh, it has been um, uh, a, a principle in the Middle East uh, since uh, Israel was founded to um, uh, propose a or propagate a narrative, which we're hearing much more of today, of colonialism and uh, worse things having to do with the Palestinians in general um, over a long period of time. But prior to that, uh, we know that the jihadist movement had a philosophy of radicalization and recruitment and violence that departed from traditional Islam and is active now throughout the Middle East, North Africa, parts of Asia, and uh, even uh, among certain communities in Europe. So this poses a problem because we have generations growing up under extreme conditions of polarization, especially in Israel and uh, the Palestinian area. And these generations are being uh, taught and uh, brought into this this narrative, which is basically uh, to get rid of the the West and Western influence in that part of the world. Well, you know, this is, I don't know why, but this I do know why. But this reminds me of them of the Muppets, and we're going to show you a clip comparing an Israeli Muppet show in Israel TV uh, and a, a uh, I guess you'd say uh, an Arab. Uh, uh, an Arab Muppet show, again, broadcast on Israeli TV. Let's see this clip. The difference between Israeli kid show and Palestinian kid show. Omar, Omar, Shalom, Ani Omar. Okay, uh, Tim, what do you get out of that? Why don't you kind of, uh, you know, summarize and explain it uh, for us? Well, it's, you know, this is, happens when radical, radicalization takes place. Is, um, the clip showed, uh, they used the term merhaba, which usually means welcome uh, in Arabic. Um, that was portrayed. And then you saw the other clips showing that uh, they wanted to be soldiers of the Mujahideen. Uh, these, you know, these are children. These are six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. So radicalization, the earlier the better. Uh, we've seen that in history with the brown shirts in Nazi Germany. Uh, we see it, you know, you, you, you basically indoctrinate your children. And it's much easier to send a message later in their later years because they've been indoctrinated very early in life and so they're more susceptible to for a different direction of thought. Yeah, you know, uh, Jason, is this, this is programming. It's programming children at an early age. And uh, I'm no psychologist, but I would guess that that program lasts a long time, if not forever. I remember seeing a video of a, of a young girl in an Arab community who was barely old enough to speak. But what she was saying was kill the Jews, kill Israel, kill America. Um, and it was it was quite impressive that those were pretty much the only words that she could speak, but somebody had taught her to say them. Um, so, you know, how long is that young girl going to keep, keep thinking that way? How permanent is the damage? Can you talk about it? Jay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Jason Olson here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, the United States, just only speaking for myself, but 
Um, this kind of worldview is very deep, and uh, it can last a lifetime, um, but it, it really comes uh, through the education system. I, I think about the difference between schools and military bases, and if we have any hope of, of changing or de-radicalizing, it's, it's got to start in the schools, and that's something where the international community has to get far more involved um, as we've seen in in the news lately with uh, UNRWA. You know, UNRWA has not been uh, very successful in de-radicalizing. In, in some cases, they've uh, encouraged and, and helped radicalization. So uh, these are these are issues where we have to look at the schools and and be responsible. And as we've mentioned, uh, the cases of de-radicalization in Japan and Germany after World War II, that meant... Uh, occupation forces from the the allies and the west going in and um and transforming these schools so you get new generations of of leaders that are de-radicalized you know you spoke of the schools and i certainly agree and uh, you know tim's reference to the brown shirts and the hitler youth and all that you know sort of prove that up on a large scale uh in in relatively modern day terms but what about the home that two-year-old child just learning to speak, she didn't get that in school. There was no school. And, and, and for a lot of these Arab kids, there is no school. Um, they get it at home. How do you change that, Jason? That that's more difficult. We, you know, it's not the it's not appropriate in our Western culture of liberal democracy for the state to intervene and penetrate the home that deeply. You know, we we like to give autonomy to parents to teach their children uh, what, you know, what they want. Um, that's, that's the right of parents all around the world. So I, I think that that's difficult. I think that the schools is one place and then, and then the media is another place. And it's when you have freedom of speech and freedom of the press, you know, the media can feed uh, children whatever it's feeding them, as we, we just saw with these clips. So, um, so the, we're, this is a, a delicate balance and friction between uh, the freedom of education, freedom of the press, and the autonomy of parents. Um, but if we're trying to de-radicalize, we, you know, these are things, there's things that we can do in the United States, um, and there's things that we can do abroad. Um, there's different authorities, and, and that's something if you're, if you're interested in getting into, right, there's more options that we can do abroad than we can do in the United States because of the Constitution and our civil liberties. Yeah, a footnote to that is I saw a piece in the paper recently about uh, these homeschool situations in the United States. And, uh, uh, and educators are looking into exactly how that works, because if you have a cult Trumper home with the parents who are cult Trumpers and you have homeschooling, you know exactly what message is being passed down to those kids who spend, you know, their their time uh, learning uh, with their parents. That's the way it works in homeschool. So I think we have an issue here in this country as well. <clears throat> you know, Gene, uh, we've talked about what happened in Germany and Japan after the war. And I have to say, those were successful, pretty much. And we de-radicalized uh, the youth that, that had participated or would participate in another war. But, you know, uh, are those good examples now, today, because if I, if I scan my own experience, my own understanding, I don't find a de-radicalization example that's actually happening, such as the one that happened uh, through MacArthur in Japan or through the American forces in Germany. I don't see that happening right now anywhere. Do you see that happening? It, could that happen? Would it work? Would it work I, like in Japan and Germany? I think... Uh... Um, Jason can answer to this. He has done more study of this than I have. Uh, just one example, Germany has been the most successful nation, according to Manfred Henningsen, who is German himself, but American now, uh, in terms of uh, de-radicalizing its past. They have established memorials and stepping stones and all kinds of ways in which th their law has been changed to... Um, they're, they're better at dealing with domestic fascism than we are today. Uh, but I think Jason has something to say about Japan. Yeah, Jason, um, you know, uh, let's talk about UNRWA. 
which is really a great tragedy. And a lot of people are denying that UNRWA did anything wrong to encourage uh, radicalization, although I think we know better. Um, and, you know, what, what could uh, UNRWA do? What could UNRWA have done to improve that? What could a, a replacement for UNRWA do now to replace that? You know, this is a very difficult mission. It's going to involve a, a whole new paradigm. What would that paradigm be, and how could we achieve it? Oh, oh thank you. It's a great question, Jay, and, and Gene as well. So, yeah, I think UNRWA, in my opinion, has failed. Uh, it's become synthesized and uh, embedded with Hamas itself. So UNRWA had, in, in many aspects, has has become integrated with Hamas. So Hamas is is on its way to being completely destroyed. Uh, my recommendation is is the unconditional surrender of Hamas, really, uh, you know, burst the bubble of of radicalization. Um, it, you know, that that kind of end state would really strike a blow. Um, but I'm also uh, studying the United Arab Emirates and the Abraham Accords in particular. Um, and uh, in 2014, the United Arab Emirates, their, their highest leadership, decided to ban uh, the Muslim Brotherhood from their country. They named the Muslim Brotherhood a, a terrorist organization, and they purged their, their sovereign territory of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and, they, and since then, uh, to put the, the antibodies uh, of radicalization into their system, they're also working on transforming and reforming their education system in an extremely positive way uh, for religious freedom, religious pluralism, uh, more human rights, more rights for women. Um, you know, that's so we, just in the last couple of years, we've seen the fruits of that, the Abrahamic family house that they opened up in Dubai with a church, a synagogue, and a mosque uh, standing in a structure equally together. Um, the Emirati state building a Jewish synagogue um, in Abu Dhabi uh, with, with state funds for the first time ever. Um, so they're, they're opening up these spaces, I think, for, like I said, both religious freedom and religious pluralism uh, and, and combating radicalization both in their uh, curriculum development, but also uh, by, by actions, symbolic actions. Um, and, and the Saudis are also doing the same thing as well. There's uh, Impact SE is an NGO that's worked closely to reform uh, you know, K through 12 or, or higher textbooks so that uh, they're removing uh, intolerance, free anti-Semitism, um, and radicalism from from the textbooks. Uh, I think that that I I'm a big believer that that's a great place to start. Well, you know, you'll have to admit this is recent. This is this very is recent. A, yeah, and so you have you have kids and families and people in the pipeline already that have been exposed to radicalism for a long, 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 long. Did I say long time? Um, and so, uh, how do you how do you take that out of the mix? How do you change their minds? I mean, take a take a four or five or six year old kid in school, uh, one who watches the Muppets, for example, and sees all this stuff about violence, and who hears it at home and from friends and and community. What do you say to that kid uh, to extract, to remove your know, term, to remove uh, the radical the radical training that kid has has had? What do you say? I, I think it's top down. It's got to start with the highest levels of the state, that the state sees it in their interest to ensure they have a, a moderate population uh, that is committed to peace, committed to prosperity, committed to um, civil rights, human rights. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the state has got to buy in, right? Um, otherwise, it, what we've seen for generations is is chaos and instability. Um, so uh, there, there's a balance there. I, I think sometimes we get in a temptation of uh, projecting our own concepts onto the Middle East region or or other regions where um, we want to just uh, only support democratization. 
um, and elections, and that's all that matters. But there's other spaces that matter as well, religious freedom, human rights, civil rights, women's rights. So I would, I would say rather than putting, you know, democratization as the top, the top goal, build these other uh, infrastructure in civil society so that when, as democratization comes slowly, the, the people are, you know, they have uh, the liberal values that will enable them to have a liberal democracy instead of like a, a radicalized democracy or um, th those are kind of the lessons that I, I've learned from studying the Middle East for, for many years. I did my, my PhD in Near Eastern and Judaic studies from Brandeis University. So that that's what I've noticed the trends, but there are great trends. And I think they're the, the best trends are state led at this point. You know, I love asking you this question, Tim, because um, you're, you're our media man. OK, because we know media plays an extraordinary role in this country increasingly. And for that matter, it plays an extraordinary role in every country these days through social media, television and otherwise. Um, where does media come into this? Where does media come into affecting the public opinion, the individual sensibilities that lead to radicalization and that lead away from radicalization? Well, I think the most recent example of media influence is the the stroke that Hamas took the second uh, they committed the atrocities in, in, in Israel. Uh, they got out in front of the cameras, in front of all the, the social media sites, and became the victims, not the perpetrators of, of, of violence and um, uh, atrocities, but they were now the victims. And so they, they caught the narrative early. And, and, and how does media play? It, well, it plays well. I mean, come on, look at advertisers. Um, they, they hone in on certain psychological needs, whether we call them Maslow's hierarchy of needs or not. Um, the number one that I think that <clears throat> uh, helps radicalization or programming, I like to call it programming, um, is the need to belong to a group, not to feel ostracized, not to feel outside that group. And... Um, you know, when you are... Uh, it, it's, it sounds like a cult, doesn't it? Well, <clears throat> you, could, uh, you could argue that many, many things in this world that are cultish. Um, you know, the first thing you do to deprogram someone is to extract them from that environment. Get them away from the ideas and, and the peer pressure of ideas to the individual. Um, you know, that's, that's step one, but that's hard to do when... You know, you live in the same community, in the same environment, day in and day out. You just don't extract children or you don't extract adults from the environment in which they live. So deprogramming is very, very difficult if you can't get them introduced to a, a new set of ideas or the old set of ideas that they used to adhere to. Um, remember, uh, well, in the case of children, they've always been exposed to it. But there's times where, where adults have been, if you want to say brainwashed, we could use that term. And um, there was a radical shift of who they were versus the identity of who they are now to be. Yeah. And Gene, you know, before the show began, I asked you a question I'd like to ask you again. Suppose I'm an official in Iran, uh, and it occurs to me that I could do my proxy wars. We have discussed that phenomenon before. Um, and the proxy wars helped me. Uh, the proxy wars helped destroy Israel, but more than that, the proxy wars helped me with a mission. They helped me to consolidate my power. They helped me connect people up um, to where I want to go. It's, it's, so my question is, is, is this official in Iran who has the ability to run proxy wars and run proxy terror groups, why does he do that? As a matter of policy, why, why does Iran want to do that? What's the purpose of establishing the proxy and of establishing jihad and of establishing radicalization? Well, Iran has a proud past as an empire, the Persian Empire, even though it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Islamic then. So they are a regional hegemon, historically. Uh, they are also Shia. And the Great Divide, we've talked about this before in the Middle East, preceding uh, the problems with Israel is a Shia-Sunni divide. And I have heard that the Shia are much more hierarchical than the Sunni. The Sunni are kind of um, 
de decentralized. Their authorities are more local. Whereas with the Ayatollahs who run Iran, there is an apex authority. I've been studying obedience to authority lately and the Milgram experiments and Zimbardo. And what's interesting, when people themselves need to be uh, disabused of violent theories like these things that take hold, um, conformity to a peer group is very important. That's the way you get recruited on the one hand. Mark Sageman has studied that. But on the other hand, for de-radicalization, if the parents' peer group generally subscribe to a set of principles and values and act out of those that do not uh, jibe with the radical views that they have, they become isolated. So if you can free up the people, the majority of the people in these countries who want peace, stability, um, they want their, their values in Islam, which is actually a very tolerant religion, uh, then they can exercise their peer pressure on those that do not. We've seen this happen domestically in the United States where white supremacist families establish themselves in places like Aryan nations in Idaho. And we've seen de-radicalization take place when they realize that they're very isolated in what they're aiming for. That's why people clump together a like-minded way if they want to cause problems. Now remember Hamas, you know, if Hamas finds a Palestinian in Gaza who disagrees with Hamas's jihad, they're gonna kill him. <clears throat> and that puts that that puts that, that puts that down. So if you want to be enlightened, if you're a Palestinian, uh, uh, if you're Muslim, in, uh, in you know in the history of the last 20 years in uh, in, in uh, Gaza, you do it at great risk. So maybe you should keep your mouth shut <clears throat> if you have to be if you have, happen to be enlightened. Now, since we covered the Muppets, I think it's only fair uh, to cover Ferdinand and Isabella. Ferdinand and Isabella, you know, running the Inquisition in the 15th century, were not perforce anti-Semitic. They knew, however, there was an anti-Semitic strain that had existed in Spain for 100 years. And they wanted to consolidate their power. And one of the things they did is they, they accommodated the anti-Semitic thread in Spain by becoming anti-Semitic and encouraging the Inquisition. So it's a question of power, isn't it? If you, you use it like a tool, you use the, the jihad, the radicalization as a tool to get people together under your control. Can you talk about that? Am I right? Am I wrong? Uh, do, you, do you rather believe the Muppets or do you rather believe uh, Isabella and Ferdinand? I haven't really studied that very much. I do know that they were busy conquering the Islamic Caliphate in Spain at the same time. And they also, uh, the Islamic Caliphate was actually quite tolerant toward Jews. And uh, maybe they had to define themselves in contradistinction to that. But we also know there, there's this history of uh, really bad anti-Semitism in the Catholic Church. Uh, Gary Wills has talked about this, and he's a Catholic for 2,000 years. So uh, they use those tools in society cynically as we accuse politicians of using such tools today. But perhaps they really believed it too. I don't know. <laughs> With respect to the jihadi virus that has uh, grown up in uh, Egypt initially and spread all the way to Afghanistan and throughout the Middle East and which fires these people up, um, it's like we're actually in another Cold War with yeah. hot spots in it. Yeah. You know, um, Jason, the, the idea about retraining, the idea about, you know, building a, a synagogue, what have you, um, it's complex because this is a very difficult task to de-radicalize the subject of our show. And um, it's not only that, but it's, it's dangerous. I mean, I, would I go as a Jewish person and settle in the land my forefathers might have lived in, uh, in you know, in the Middle East, a land which is now anti-Semitic. Would I go there and try to be, uh, you know, the the, the the cutting edge of the reemergence of Judaism in that 
country, participate in the development of a, of a synagogue there. Um, that sounds hard and it sounds dangerous. I mean, you know, life-threateningly dangerous. So where's the cutting edge here? And who will do it? It's nice to hear about some of these countries that have been made more liberal, more tolerant, but who, who should get the point on this? Who should be the leader on this? Well, uh, it, it's, we're, we're at a, a paradox. Um, there are trends in the Middle Eastern region. Um, as Jean said, there, there have been periods of time, the, the golden age of Spain, and we, we look at Maimonides, the Rambam, uh, there have been times in Jewish Islamic history where there was great tolerance. Um, and so some of these states, the United Arab Emirates, for example, and Bahrain, um, they're, they're looking at the last you know, century as kind of an aberration, and they're trying to go back to a time when Jews and Muslims had warm relations and tolerant relations, which there, there are pockets throughout history. Um, Unfortunately, what's what's happened, like, that's, that's why it's so critical, like I said, that United Arab Emirates uh, banned the Muslim Brotherhood, made, made it a terrorist organization. What's happening is Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, other jihadist organizations have uh, metastasized and spread out throughout the world, including in the United States, um, and, and also, also perched themselves in uh, different college campuses in the West, um, throughout the West. And so they've, uh, in some cases, they've been expelled from different Middle Eastern countries and they found homes uh, in other places in the world where they're continuing a war against the Jewish people, a war against the United States, a war against the West. Um, and so it's, it, there's a globalization. And we, we saw that with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was the first to really decide uh, we're going to expand our war from just Israel and Saudi Arabia, the Saudi monarchy, and we're going to make a global jihad. Um, and, and that's what we're finding. They're, they're willing to find new spaces where they can thrive and uh, attack their, their enemies. Yeah, you know, Tim, that, that opens the question of whether the United States, as a target of radicalism, one of the targets, the main target, the West, you know, the United States can be the city on the hill and can be the leader in, in trying to de-radicalize other places in the world. Is it qualified? Is it qualified these days with a fair amount of anti-Semitism going on in the country, an increasing amount of anti-Semitism? Um, could it ever be? What would have to happen before the United States could resume its liberal role as the leader of tolerance in the world? Or is that in our history only? No, I, I don't think it was in our history only. I, I'm thinking of the 60s when John Kennedy made the famous quote, ask not what you can do to your country, what you're, you know, ask not what the country can do for you, but what you can do to your country. How many people volunteered to do outreach in, in foreign countries, in, in third world countries? And so there was this informal diplomatic corps, if you will, that showed people what America was about by their deeds and actions, not versus the stereotypes that were formatted to these populations um, for stereotypes of Americans and how America was. So through action, um, a lot of myths were dispelled. Um, I'm thinking also of even in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, there was an effort to go into villages and show uh, the kindness of the, the military, um, that we weren't just there at boots on the ground and, and camouflage that um, people wore, that they were interested in, in, in building schools, um, hopefully not through nation building, but through humanity building. And the military became a part of that, I think. Um, to what degree that was successful, I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe Jason has a better sense of that than I do. But there was an effort, at least, to dispel the myth and the stereotypes of Americans and how we're bent on destruction and, and, and war. I have a hard question for you, Tim. Given all of that, given all that we've talked about today, suppose I find a, a murderous radical who has killed a lot of people, okay? And, uh, okay, a war criminal, that kind of thing. Um, do, I, do I try to show him a better path or her? Do I try to explain to him how wrong he was? 
or do I throw him in the slammer forever to keep him off the streets? What do I do to protect myself against this murderer? Well, I think you're referring to justice, and there is international justice, there is local justice, and uh, justice needs to be implemented, uh, particularly if there's a, a radical murderer on, you know, at your front doorstep. But I also caution against the what I would call the sum to more argument. That is, there's some group of people that act like this. Therefore, as a, a form of argument, we 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 um, we project that onto a, a wider population. That therefore they must be like this. Um, you know, you, you talk to anyone who travels in the Middle East, any American, they go, "My God, why would you go to Jordan?" Or, "My God, why would you go to all these countries when there's radicals everywhere?" Well. Maybe that's the stereotype. And number two is maybe that's the sum to more argument that, yes, there are a group of these radicals, but you can't broad based paint an entire population to be that same radical um, uh, theology or, or philosophy. Yeah, familiarity helps, you know, I mean, that's why the Israeli I went to Israel and they put me on a tour around the border. They wanted me to be there at the border, a tourist at the border. And, um, you know, so I could see and people could see me. And so maybe if you force the familiarization, that helps. It's time for our closing statements. And I can see that Jason is, is wound up about many, many issues here. So I want to ask him first to summarize what he would like to leave with our audience today. Oh, I just, I think that, um, I think that the United States of America is, is a, a quintessential country and that uh, to solving these problems requires American leadership and American intervention. That's been my experience. Things don't just happen on their own. Um, we can't just uh, extract ourselves as as uh, Americans and and just expect everything to to, to run well. We we need to have uh, well crafted strategies. We need both uh, our academics and our policy communities and our elected leaders to work together to. To solve the the problems of the world and and to exert leadership, the the countries of the world look to the United States for our leadership. They want to see what we have to say and what we want to do. And many times, if it's if it's a good solution, they they support. No, I I'm interested in that. I feel strongly about that. I also feel it affects my personal security um, to make sure there is no uh, jihadi attack here in this country. Uh, so I'm perfectly willing to take steps, Jason, as an ordinary schmo. What do I do as an ordinary schmo? Well, I, I think you 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 partner with uh, you partner with your leaders, support leaders, become a leader, um, and, and it just it, instead of hiding inside of a shell, a turtle shell, you you get out, uh, you you go to other countries, you you persuade. Uh, you engage in you can engage in citizen diplomacy. You can engage in education efforts. Um, we we all can play a part um, to make the world a better place. It's just uh, uh, I, I worry about the different forms of isolationism, especially at a time now when uh, the world is breaking apart at the seams, and we have we have wars in Europe and we have wars in the Middle East, and um, we're trying to prevent more wars from breaking out. So I think it's engage talk you know we have social media now so can you can communicate with anyone in the whole world at any time yeah but before i leave you though um i just want to touch on the social media thing there's so much um disinformation that means lying on social media sure. it's so easy to be misinformed what you've read a lot you've written a lot you've spoken a lot where do I look for a clear message on this? What should I be reading? Just take take a couple off the top, some sources that I need to check on regularly. Well, I can only, my own personal opinion of, of voices that I, I think are helpful, I, I am a big fan of, uh, of uh, Neil Ferguson and Victor Davis Hanson. Um, I, I, I am uh, trained in, in history, so I I think uh, it's important to to look for the lessons of the past because those are real facts and real evidence that we have. 
um, and, and try to find patterns from the past of what succeeded and what failed, um, and then see how they can be applied to, to current problems. Um, well, that means every... we, should be, we should be talking to you on a regular basis, get a handle on that. <laughs> Gee, thank well, I, you. I'm just one, one among one among some, but uh, th those are some some sources. The really good historians that that rely on facts are are the best uh, sources, in in my opinion. Gene, thank you for bringing Jason Olson to us. Appreciate you arranging this. I hope we can do it again. Now, <clears throat> as far as you're concerned, you know what what do you take from this? What lessons have we touched on here that you would emphasize? I think we need to be very careful about understanding the anthropology of each country. Even the way people think logically is different. So that's one thing. We need knowledgeable people involved in this. This is all a soft power program. We're engaged in military imposing security on zones which are very insecure. That's number one. But once you've done that, after the Gaza war is over, everybody's been saying, well, what do you do next? Well, then you use the soft power, and Jason has spoken somewhat to that. The other thing I want to verify is that it's not always just top-down. As a former member of the Peace Corps, and I'm going to date myself now, way back in the night. Oh, 19th. we never knew that, Jean. I have a whole <laughs> different view of you now. <laughs> now uh, I was a few years out of college when I went into the Peace Corps. Great experience, and um, I learned a lot from it. And what I learned most of all, is that they taught me about the world. Americans are too isolated. We're too clumped together. Jason's uh, admonition to get out. If you, if you want to do something, get out to another country. We took our kids. My, my husband was a doctor in the Peace Corps, too, before I met him. We took our kids to a third world country when they were small on purpose because they were so privileged. And we wanted them to see that they could connect. And they did. They did connect with teenagers in that country. Well, Tim, uh, your thoughts here to close. Uh, are you going to be watching more of the Muppets? No, I will not be watching more of the Muppets. <laughs> I didn't watch them when I was a child. Nor do I intend to as an adult. So, um, I, I, you know, my final thoughts are, and, and maybe I'm taking a left turn this topic, but I think we need to bring psychologists and psychiatrists into the discussion. What is it about the frailty of the human condition, the human mind, that it takes relatively little work to craft tools of what we would call propaganda and work its magic relatively easy to, to completely shift one's attitude, values, and beliefs uh, in a 180-degree different direction? And, and what does that say about human beings as a species that they're so malleable and, and, and influenced so easily? And until we understand the, uh, I think, the physiology of the human mind and how, how weak it is, um, radicalization will continue from here to eternity, or at least to the, the date of the human species becomes extinct, whichever comes first. So the question, Jane and Jason, is whether the species is perfectible or imperfectible, and we are at that inflection point. Thank you very much for joining us today, Gene and Jason and Tim. Aloha. If you liked this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel? Thanks so much.